Good morning. Welcome to Alligator Preserves. I'm your host, Laurel McCarg, and today I'm joined with a scary guest, but we'll get into that. Today I'm joined by Scott Thomas, who has written TV movies and teleplays for various networks, including Netflix, the Sci-Fi Channel, MTV, VH1, you know, places we've heard of, Disney Channel, Nickelodeon, and others. Uh, welcome, Scott Thomas. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Where are you? Where are you coming from right now? Colorado or California? Looks like I'm California. in California. I'm in uh, Sherman Oaks, California, and in, in uh, outside LA. So. All right. Well, I know that you have some ties with Colorado, correct? I do. My mom lives in Buena Vista, so we go out to Colorado once, at least once a year. We we make a little road trip and drive out there from here. And I'm right down the road from there. Uh, I live in Salida, which is a beautiful yep. place, and. We woke up to frost on the grass and, and on my ducks this morning. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty nice here. It's uh, currently, um, it's, it's a little cool for us. So it's, it's uh, in the low 70s right now. Um, oh. And then it's going to uh, get hot later. We might get up to the 70s today. But anyway, it's, we both live in beautiful places, obviously. Well, Let's start with some general questions. I've got a bunch of random questions for you, but let me start with something general because most of our listeners are authors, writers, interested in the, the technique of writing and the, the different genres. How is writing for the screen different from writing for um, a bookshelf? Uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it, it's... Uh sort of the, the main principles, I guess, apply, but it is a very different beast. Um, you know, with, uh, with screenwriting, um, you're only writing what uh, you're going to see. Uh, so um, it's very, you know, the, the description is very sparse and the, and it's dialogue driven. Um, it's uh, action driven, you know, anything that you're writing an emotion or, a, a, you know, anything that happens, you, 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 you have to be able to see it or hear it. So um, you can't really be in someone's head unless it's voiceover. Um, so a lot, so you have to find ways of showing people what, what people are feeling, what is happening um, with, uh, with writing a book. Um, you can really dig in and you can get into people's heads. You can digress a little bit um, with, uh, with a, a TV show or a movie you are writing for a specific, generally a specific, you know, uh, hour and a half, two hours, if it's a movie, um, if it's a half hour show, you're writing for that half hour show, there's a certain page count you have to hit, um, that it can't really be much longer than that. With a book, you can go off on tangents, you can explore other things that may have happened, you know, it's, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot more discovery in writing a book, I think. A lot of people have a problem with the show versus tell idea. It comes up all the time. How do I do that? How do you do it? Um, when you write, you know, I, I I talk a lot. Of, you know, because I I run uh, TV shows, um, and so uh, as a showrunner, you are in charge of you know everything from the you know, uh, every, every department head reports to you. Um, you really, your boss is the network or whoever's paying to make this. But, uh, but other than that, you are sort of the boss with, with all the departments under you and, and you have a writer's room uh, on a TV show. And so in a writer's room, you, you have, you know, you may have six or seven or eight or 10 or 12, however big the show is, writers who, who are writing episodes of the show. And one of the biggest things I feel like that I'm always sort of, you know, talking to people about is this idea of sort of writing around something. So instead of just writing the beats and, and I feel like that sort of applies to the, you know, the show don't tell. Um, I find that <clears throat> like when we break an outline for a TV show and, and, and then we hand that outline off to a writer, um, they will sometimes just go, just write, okay, and then this happens. So that person has to say this thing or this thing needs to happen and then this happens and this happens and that. And, you know, that's not really how life works. Generally, there's a lot of talking around things before we really get to them. And, and sometimes you can have um, a scene that you know needs to end in a certain or, or really is about a reveal or, or someone saying a certain thing. But the interesting thing about the scene is how you get there. You know, how do, how do, you, how do you, if you had something 
that you sort of dreaded telling someone, you probably wouldn't just come in and go, you know what, this happened today and you're going to be very upset about it. You would, you would start other conversation. You would try to avoid it. You would try to sort of guide them into a, uh, into a situation where that you could, you could tell them this. Um, and that, those are the things I think that, that to kind of keep in mind when, when writing is, is, you know, um, instead of just telling the, uh, telling your, your readers or your audience that, uh, you know, and then this happens and then this happens, it's really, how would that happen in real life? How would that unfold? You know, how do you want this scene to unfold? And I think that's, that's really the showing, uh, not the telling is, is really thinking about how, how, how a scene and, and unfolds and how the characters are going to, uh, you know, what's the interesting way that the characters are going to, you know, make this one thing happen because each you know you sort of want each scene to be about something you know each scene is moving the narrative forward and so how, how are you going to um just like in real life what's a what's a kind of an intriguing way that maybe uh this is gonna you know play out and bring bringing the realism into it and um in a 2017 interview you did with uh, Daryl Maxwell for Los Angeles Public Library. You were talking about Kill Creek and you talked about the difference between plot versus story. And I think that's what you're talking about right now, right? A plot is this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. The story is who, who is the person, who are the people doing the happenings? And, you know, as you mentioned, Easy. Yeah, I think I think even more. I mean, and and sort of the the plot versus story goes. <clears throat> I think even sorry, there's a giant, two giant blackbirds on top of these trees that have decided to just call. You should, um, you should have told me that there was a dinosaur or something. No, it's uh, but it's a, little, it's a little ominous for talking about horror um, eventually. <laughs> uh, but uh, just in case you hear them cawing, it'll just add atmosphere. So. Um, so with, with sort of plot versus story, uh, you know, the plot is the A to B to C to D of, of you know, the events um, that unfold. The, the story to me is, what, why are you telling this? What is the story really about? What is this, you know, tale that you're telling really about? And, um, you know, uh, there, there was an interview, the thing that really made it click for me probably 20 years ago, I was reading an interview um, with uh, the screenwriter of Die Hard. And um, if, if you all remember that movie. Yes, uh, our, our favorite Christmas movie every year. Yes, fantastic. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and he was talking about how Die Hard is, you know, when, when we think of Die Hard, we go, well, it's about, a, you know, a cop who is trapped in a building and there's terrorists and he's the only one who can fight them off and, and stop them. But that's the plot. The story is it's about a guy who's trying to fix his marriage with his wife, to with his estranged wife. And that's why you care. You know, the story is why you care about these characters, why you care about this story. And the reason that, that Die Hard works so well and why we care about John McClane in that movie is because he's there to try to patch things up with his wife and, and we feel for him. And then this crazy thing happens. And all he's trying to do really is save his wife from, from these terrorists. And, um, and uh, so that's the story. And, and so when I started writing Kill Creek, um, which is about uh, you know, four authors, the plot is you know, four authors are in four horror authors at various stages of their career are invited to um, a notorious supposedly haunted house uh, for a Halloween night interview. Um, and uh, that's sort of the setup, you know, and of course then things go wrong from there. But um, with, but the, I didn't really know what the story was and I started writing it and I knew it was about all these authors and I started writing chapters about these authors. And um, there was actually a chapter that didn't end up making it into the book, I don't think. But it was, uh, it was one of the characters at home. He was an older character. And as I was writing it, he woke up in the middle of the night and he was confused. And then I realized in that moment that he had sort of the, he was showing the first signs of dementia. And is, and is this Sebastian you're talking about? Yeah, Sebastian. He was showing the first signs of dementia. And I realized kind of in that moment that this entire book was about 
us wanting to what we will do to be remembered and about memory and about you know that we write to sort of be remembered and and to to uh almost uh, be immortal in some way if we write something good enough that, that lasts the you know the test of time um and uh uh I, I knew right then that that was that was the story that I was telling about not only the characters but about the house uh, that also wants to be remembered. It's a it's a haunted house. It has a legacy. Um, it's about these you know uh, Sebastian who's literally losing his memories um, and is going to you know possibly one day forget everything uh, that his the the good and the bad of his life. And that's when I realized that's what the story of that was. And that's when I felt like, okay, now I can really dig into this. And now I know what the theme is and I can make sure that plays out through the entire book. It was a, it's a fascinating plot and story. It's kind of like a, it's a story in the story about stories, kind of like mm -hmm. you're in a, a, a creepy house of mirrors kind of, kind of place with a fabulous ending, which we won't disclose but uh <laughs> it, it's amazing now based on some feedback that you got on kill creek you changed some of your characters so your your biggest change yeah talk to me about 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 getting feedback and about what you do with that feedback well i mean the it's incredible i first of all i will say i i hate rewriting I, 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 once I finish a first draft i just wish that was the finished draft because i want to go okay great that's done What's moving next? on to the next thing with um but rewriting is so incredibly important and also listening to uh to you know people you trust and not just friends and family but but people who will be honest with you and straight with you and give you constructive criticism there are definitely plenty of people in, in life who just want to tear you down and make themselves feel better but um finding those people who will read your your writing and give you constructive criticism is incredibly helpful. And I had the benefit of with Kill Creek of um, having a publisher involved. And so I had an editor that I was working with and who was actually the the, um, the head of, of Inkshares who publishes my books. And um, he and I had a really good relationship and and we, uh, you know, I just really trusted his his instincts. Um, and so he read the first, I had written, just to, to give a little backstory, I'd written Kill Creek pretty soon after I moved to LA. I grew up in Kansas, in a small town in Kansas, and then I moved to Los Angeles after I graduated from college. Um, I moved out in 98, and I was out here for a few years, and I was trying to work in TV and, and film. And um, and I decided I was going to try to, I had this idea for Kill Creek and I was like, okay, I'm going to write a book. And so I sat down and in my spare time, I wrote the first draft of Kill Creek and I was just never able to, to get it in the right hands. Uh, and then about probably, tw you know, 12 or 13 years later, I was sitting on this, this manuscript, uh, there was a, uh, a contest, um, that uh, through this this uh, website called Tracking Board, they had this Launchpad manuscript competition every year, and I think now it's called the Launchpad Prose Competition, and it's it's happening this year as well. Uh, I think I think people can still enter it, um, and uh, if you have even the first fifty pages of a book, because uh, I think that's all you have to to submit, I would hi highly recommend seeking that out. Um, but I saw that I just discovered that online randomly, and I decided I would enter, you know, Kill Creek, what, you know, couldn't hurt anything. I was sitting on this, this book that I wasn't getting published. And so I entered it in this contest and I kind of watched as it made the top hundred it made the top 50 it made the top 25 and it made the top 10. It didn't win, but it did make the top 10. And so it got the attention of one of the, um, of, of, uh, sorry, there's a plane out going overhead. I hear it. Yeah. Yeah. I prefer the crows. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the crows were better. Uh, this is life in LA. There's always a plane or a helicopter going around. <laughs> so, um, so I, uh, you know, uh, got the attention of Ink Shares, which they were one of the sponsors of this competition. And um, they want, said they wanted to fully publish Kill Creek. So I started working with, with them. And you know, uh, I I had never hadn't really ever had feedback on on this um, on this book, and 
we started really tearing it apart and kind of going, okay, what is, that's really when we went, okay, this, a lot of this plot works, but how do we make it even stronger? And Adam from InkShares had great, really, really great ideas. And we discussed a lot of things. And one of the biggest things was originally all four authors were men. And he was like, you know, you, you really should, should make, you know, at least one of these authors, a woman and, and not just have all these, these dudes in this house. And so, uh, I, so I really just kind of started thinking about each character. And the one that really intrigued me the most was TC Moore, who originally was a man. And so when I decided that TC Moore was going to be a woman, it really changed that story so much. And I felt like it became even richer and more intriguing of, of going sort of why, why is this, um, if she is, even though, you know, thankfully there are, a, 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 there have always been a lot of, of female horror writers and women in, who love horror, but it feels, you know, in, in the past, and growing up in the 80s and 90s, guys were really the ones who were sort of getting the opportunities to do this. And, and uh, with the exception of Anne Rice or, you know, <clears throat> even going back to like Shirley Jackson, somebody like that, they're really, the guys were sort of the, you know, Stephen King and Peter Straub and all these people were, were getting all the attention. Uh, so I really kind of tried to go, okay, if this is, if this is a, a, a woman who is, writes horror, she writes very extreme horror in kind of a Clive Barker way. Um, and, uh, and she kind of is always fighting this expectation of what a woman should write, what a female horror author should write, uh, which her books are very sexual and very violent. And I think that bothers a lot of the guys in, in the, in the, sort of in the book and in this in this world in the world <laughs> yeah which you know in a in a very stereotypical way the guy you know is sort of you know uh a, applying stereotypes to her and then um and trying to sort of pigeonhole her and then also her being a female horror author who's kind of trying to break out in what is at you know at the time i wrote it was still very much a boys club um, that and 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 it's it's not still not 50 50 it's still not I I even in the way that it should be but it is getting much better there are there are a lot more um, women who have been writing horror their whole lives who are now getting recognition and getting the opportunities that, that guys always always did in the past and so that really changed tc Moore's story for me and and even the fact that you added that female energy and character into the story um, I would say enriched or gave, gave you more to talk about with the relationship stuff, right? With Sam, mm -hmm. with how, how guys will interact with women and their expectations. So, so that I think you wouldn't have had that had she remained a dude. No, it definitely would have still been very much that boys club that I kind of realized in making, in making um, more a, a female character um that i realized was you know there was an opportunity to to sort of call that out and let her be um breaking through that um even though there's still she's still fighting and the the thing that was really that, that then became very interesting the the we decided to originally the book followed all four authors separately and then they ended up in the house and in speaking with um adam and inchairs we you know, we decided to really focus the first part, the first few chapters, just on two characters, on Sam and on Moore, and let them sort of lead us into the story where then we meet Sebastian and we meet Daniel, the other two authors, and and Wainwright, who's invited them there. And so let them, but let Moore and, and, and Sam be really our main characters. And in doing that, I realized, because they're both dealing with trauma from the past, um, I realized that they're, they're sort of, they're, masking it and and trying to forget it in different ways whereas sam is uh he, he he's repressing his past trauma and the horrors that he has uh experienced um more is incredibly aggressive about how she you know wears her armor and so um her armor is aggression and her armor in to protect herself from these the the, the things that have happened to her in the past she will try to put you on the back foot immediately 
when she meets you and try to, you know, say something to let you know that you are, uh, that she's in charge. And Sam just wants to hide out. He just, he just wants to be left alone. He just wants to hide with his demons. So, so it became a very write, interesting dichotomy there. What, when you write, this is probably a difficult question to answer, but what's your planning to pantsing ratio when you, when you write a story? Like how many, how many surprises do you allow to happen? As, because I'm assuming that you do some planning. I do some planning. I, I, um, I also, in addition to rewriting, I hate outlining. Uh, I, I find it very sterile and, and not very fun. Um, and I love, I love writing a story in the way, in the same way that I love reading a story. I like it to unfold and I like there to be surprises and discoveries and things that I didn't expect to happen. And so I will outline, I do outline when, when uh, most of the time I will do some sort of outline, even if it's just really broad beats that I've laid out. So I know exactly. Um, I mean, I will, I will say that it's it, whether it's in my head or it's on paper, I always have signposts for the entire story. I always know exactly where it's going to end. I feel like I can't really start writing a book or a script or anything until I know exactly how it ends. Even if that, uh, that ends up changing a little bit, if there's a twist, if there's something, cause there was, sort of a little bit of a, a, a twist in, in Kill Creek that I didn't plan um, that wasn't originally there, but I knew what the climax of the story was going to be. And as long as I know what the climax is, then I feel like, the, and I know where it starts, then I just sort of mentally or on paper plot out the, what are the, what are the major beats of this story? You know, it's, it's with Kill Creek, you know, there's a prologue that introduces the house and the history of the house. Then I knew we were going to meet our characters. Then they were going to get this kind of mysterious invitation to this interview in, at the house on Kill Creek. They were going to go there. And then I knew all the events, the, the, you know, the big broad events that unfolded from there. But a lot of times that's kind of all I'll have in, in, in plant is just knowing what the next big signpost is um so that i give i give myself that freedom in between there to make some discoveries and have some fun because do you I really generally do you generally follow a, a save the cat kind of outline no no uh no i i will i will say it, it depends uh i think with a with I, with a book, it's a little bit different with a, with a script, with especially a, a movie, a feature script. Um, I do, I do believe in the three act structure that, that with a, with a script, especially we're so used to watching movies and, and, and uh, especially watching movies and TV shows, uh, generally movies though, with the three act structure. So you kind of have the first act is really kind of setting up the characters and the situation and then the problem. And then the second act is, is sort of uh, you know the escalation of that problem and and trying to stop it and then there's always sort of a dark night of the soul at the end of the second act where everything is lost and then that launches you into the third act where everything is lost but there may be a solution we have to fight the singer we have to do this you know we have to accomplish this goal and then carry yeah, carries you to the end so I really do we're we're so used to that that in, it, I, I I do believe in either kind of following that three act structure or finding a really interesting way to bucket and uh, but make that your plan. If you're going to do it, you know, if you're going to sort of buck that system, then do it in an interesting way. Cause there've been plenty of movies that I've watched that don't really follow that. And yet don't really seem to, they're not specifically trying to fight against that, that layout. And you find yourself just kind of adrift and going, what is this story that I'm being told? Um, with with a book, I, I because I come from a, a background of writing TV and, and movies, I think I do write in a very cinematic way, and I think that I still do kind of apply that three act structure to to books. Um, but as for kind of a save the cat, you know, really specific, always hitting the same beat, I don't believe in that. I I, I think there are valuable lessons that you can take from that structure, you know, sort of the, the, obviously the kind of the name save the cat, which uh, if, if people don't know is a, 
a screenwriting book um, that sort of is very helpful if you're learning, kind of first learning how to write a script um, that, that gives you kind of these, these are sort of the, the, the beats that most stories follow. And, and one of them with making someone a likable person or a likable character is to give, you know, let them help someone early on or, or show, let them show, you know, do something that makes you care about them early on. And that's where the sort of, you, they save the cat kind of thing comes from. And so, um, but, uh, but I don't know. I, I, I find that too. Too rigid. Too rigid, too confining. I, I really, too I really. Predictable. Kind of, for a writer, I think, for me, the, the fun is in the discovery. And if I am going, well, this is really interesting, but it doesn't fit this, these beats that some other person laid out for me, then what's the point Shakespeare. of that? Shakespeare, Shakespeare, some other person. <laughs> yes, you should follow that, but you should follow that, that exciting thing. You know, that might take you off in a different direction that it still might dovetail back into what you had, but there might be a discovery there it might lead to a dead end. And then you go, okay, I have to backtrack. That didn't work. But at least that's the fun of it to me. That's the fun of writing. Allowing discoveries and surprises. What scared you as a child? Um, a lot scared me. Uh, the I, most? Uh, nuclear war. The thought of nuclear war scared me the most when I was a kid because I grew up in the eighties and it was constantly talked about and we were and we were constantly sort of still in this cold war with with Russia and there were movies about Red Dawn and the day after and all these movies about uh, the horrors of nuclear war and I, I that was that was probably the thing that I was the most the, the real thing that I was the most scared of growing up was the thought of of that um and you happening. probably you probably didn't believe that hiding under your school desk would help you right? i didn't at that point i think we were past that i think we had we had seen uh we there have been too many too many movies where i'd seen uh, people just turning into bones but um for you know i i, I always loved horror i always loved ghost stories i uh, just from a i don't even remember i was from kindergarten on i i loved going to the library and going there was at our public library there's one section that had um ghosts books on ghosts and ufos and the loch ness monster and everything uh, all these you know psychic powers and all kinds of stuff and the bermuda triangle i would always go straight to that and i would read everything there and i would check it out again and reread it and i just loved those books and whenever there was a book fair at school I would buy every book on ghosts or, or anything like that. And so I loved reading about this stuff. And I loved, like, uh, there was a, a, a children's book that I had uh, called, that, that is a picture book, basically, but it's really sort of macabre and strange. It's called Grandpa's Ghost Stories. And uh, I still have my copy, and I, I, I gave it to my kids when they were little. And it's very, it's very kind of demented and great. And um, I loved that. I loved uh, scary stories to tell in the dark, all those, all those books. I loved campfire stories, just hearing like ghost stories, but I, they terrified me. So I, I would watch a scary movie and then I would be sleeping with my parents for a week. You know, it was like, I, I, uh, I, I always really wanted to do something like go like on Halloween, go to a haunted house that, you know, was what the people were putting on. Or one time there was a production of Dracula that was uh, the community theater was doing. And I was so excited to go. And then I would get right up to the door and I would chicken out. And with Dracula, I wouldn't even go in. Like I, I was so excited to see this. And then I got there and I freaked out. And one of my parents had to sit in the car with me while everyone else <laughs> thought it was a play. And, uh, but I always was intrigued by this. I just loved these scary stories. Well, for I, was some gonna, I was going to ask, why do you think some people like you, like me, not everyone, why do you think some people crave that, that scare? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, th I think, uh, first of all, I think it's just exciting. I think that, or I think there's, there's something exciting about, you know, it's the same reason that people like roller coasters and some don't. It's the same reason that, you know, like some people just really hate being scared. They hate being uneasy because there's enough uneasiness in life anyway. And they really just want to, if they're going to watch something or read something or experience something, they want it to be um, 
pleasant. And uh, for me, it was always, and I think, I think there are a lot of people like me where there was something cathartic about experiencing those things. You would go through it and it would be scary, but you knew it wasn't real. And so you would go through it and it would terrify you and you would scream and then you would laugh and because it scared you. And then you get to the end and you live through it and you are excited and thrilled and talking about it. And, and it was such a fun experience. And because you knew it wasn't real and you survived it. And I, I do think there's, I think there's something with, for me, and, and this is nothing original, many of people have pointed this out, um, who have talked about horror, uh, the genre of horror. Um, but I think there is something cathartic about, uh, you know, life is scary. You turn on the news every day, it's awful. It's never ending. It's not like you, you know, turn on the news one day and they go, hey, you know that thing that we've been scaring you about for the past two years? It's done, we fixed it, you know? They ne that never happens. They scare you with a bunch of stuff and then something new comes up and it's just constantly, there's scary things out in the world and, and there seems to be no solution. So when you read a, a, a scary book or a story or you watch a scary movie, um, or you even go to a haunted house on Halloween or whatever, you get to the end of that and there's resolution. You know, when you watch a scary movie, you someone ends up fighting back against the 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 evil and they beat it, even in even if in the very last scene it comes back to set up a sequel, you know that uh sorry, one more play. That's okay. uh, you, you you know you know that uh that at least you got to experience them beating it. And so I think did, there did you, I was gonna say, did your parents ever protest you reading things that- They didn't. Ended, ended up with you in their bed for a week? <laughs> no, well, they didn't. I mean, obviously there were, there were things. I had two, I was the youngest of three and I, so I had two older brothers. So I saw a lot of things probably earlier than I should have um, because my, you know, brother who was six years older than me would rent movies and, and things that then I would sneak in and watch when all of his friends were watching. Um, but, um, but no, they were incredibly supportive and, and they were not into those kinds of things. Like they, they, it was not like, like I am where if my kids were really into horror movies, I would be excited and I would just start showing them everything I could. Um, they, were, they were not into that, but they also were incredibly supportive. I think they saw that it was a creative outlet, um, that, that it was healthy um, and that uh, I'm sure they had conversations together about is he okay um but they never expressed it to me which was nice. all right well th that was a question i was going to ask is about after people read your work do they look at you differently and, and i'm asking you this because when i write short stories i tend to go dark like really dark yeah. and one in particular when i read to my husband he suggested that maybe he or i should sleep in a different room that night <laughs> <laughs> uh I, I think, I don't think anyone has really seen me differently, but I do think that, um, well, maybe, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I think once, once someone reads something that you've written that is, is dark and, and kind of goes to a place that they normally don't let their mind go or, or has some kind of shocking things happen in it, I, I think that really, you know, then they go, the biggest thing is they just go, how, like, why, <laughs> you know, why, why does your head go there? You know, like, like how, why tell these stories? And how do you answer that? Uh, it's sort of the way I just did about horror. And then also um, it's just how my head works. I just, you know, some people really want to watch a romance or a comedy and that's all they want to experience. And with my brain, I'm always taking normal situations and going, how can I twist this into something kind of dark and, and messed up? And it just, it, and I find it fun. I find it, it's, it's like a, you know, it's, I like figuring out stories and thinking of stories. And for some reason, it's almost always something horrific. Uh, and, and I and, you blame know, it on your muse, right? I mean, blame it on your, your alter muse or, or your muse. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just what I'm interested in. And, I think that, um, you know, I think they know me and they know I'm not like that. So I think it's, it, and most people who are, in, who 
aren't you know write horror or into into dark you know writing thrillers or anything aren't like that you know they're pretty normal and they're pretty boring <laughs> and then uh and then they and then but that's just the things that interest you um i think it's hard it's hard for some people to understand because they just aren't into that but i think uh i don't know that i think they only see me differently in that they go oh that that's what he's into it's it's like uh any and you know they can judge or whatever i don't care it's it is what i'm into oh excellent because i love it um all right so nuclear war scared you when you were a child what scares you now uh you know, probably you know the thought of anything happening to my family is probably the biggest you know I am, i'm married i have two kids and um and that really i think now has influenced what I write. Um, I think uh, I write. I, I, I tend to write a lot more sort of domestic horror now, like thing, things that would just happen in in your normal life, and things things that I think the idea of something coming in and tearing apart your safety, your sort of you know safe zone is is your you know this this put your home, your family your school, your below your, the workplace that you love, your your work family, anything, anything where you go, this is this is where I feel safe. Anything that comes in and tries to sort of destroy that, I think is is pretty terrifying. Um, because earlier you mentioned, you know, the the scare, you knew that it wasn't real. Now you're talking about things that are almost real or, or close to real. real. And, and I think that's important in writing, uh, in writing anything. Um, obviously, if you're writing a, a drama or you're writing a thriller that's very much, you know, based and set in the real world and grounded, then you're already writing about things like that, things that are real and things, uh, um, situations uh, that are tearing apart, you know, something that we can all relate to. When you're writing something a little more fantastic, if you're writing fantasy or you're writing, um, uh, you know, sci-fi or you're writing um, a hor uh, like, you know, you're writing horror. Yeah, I think it's still incredibly important to ground that and and go even if you're dealing with some fantastic monster or beast or entity, then you need to sort of counterbalance that with. What is the grounded story you're telling, and what is what is the thing that we can all that every reader can relate to? Um, and I think that is the the scariest thing that you can do to anyone is, you know, obviously the sort of most basic thing is something threatening your life or your your actual body, because that is pretty terrifying. But then beyond that. It's the emotional connections we have. It's the things that we value in our lives, something coming in and threatening that. Um, and I think that with with Kill Creek, Kill Creek is a little bit, a little more plot driven uh, than like Violet, um, which was my second book. But but Kill Creek also has something that happens halfway through that, that I think so, a lot of people didn't really expect. And then now this entity that they've accidentally sort of uh don't tell too much her. don't tell too much i, I won't but <clears throat> it is starting to really threaten their their lives every aspect of their lives and i think that is really when the book starts to become scary for me is that now it's 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 not just a hook the story isn't just a hook now it's not just for horror authors go to a haunted house on halloween now now this thing is really starting to threaten aspects of their lives that, that we can all relate to. And with Violet, which um, was my second book, that that's very much the story of a mother and a daughter. And that to me hit even closer to home because I have two daughters and that's horrifying. Any Anything that could come in and threaten them or influence them in a bad way is scary. And so that's really, I think, where that's what where, where the horror for me comes from. The rest is just exciting. It's fun. It's craziness happening. It's, it's you know, uh, but that's the scary part. So that probably is the answer to my question. What's the most important element in a, hor in a horror story? I think, uh, yeah, I think it's obviously having, having a, 
you know, an interesting threat, whatever that's going to be, something that's intriguing, because that's what's going to lure people in to read it or watch it is if it's a haunted house story, what's maybe a twist you could put on it. If it's, you know, if it's a monster, what is this monster that, that is intriguing that basically when, because most people are going to read the back of a book or the inside sleeve of a book, or they're going to read the, you know, three sentence description of a movie on their, in their, you know, TV on their guide, the guide on their TV. And um, that's, they're going to, or they're going to see a two minute trailer and that's what's going to make them decide if they're going to watch it or read it. And so that's, that's to me, it, again, it goes to plot and story. The plot is the two minute trailer. What is the thing that's going to really intrigue people? Oh, it's a monster movie, but that looks like a really cool monster. It's got a really cool kind of spin on it. And, and it's interesting, you know, what's happening here. Alien is a great example. You know, uh, uh, Alien is really a haunted house monster story. It's, it's a haunted house story and it's a, it's a monster story. And it's, but it's set on a spaceship, you know, there's a drift in space and it's this beast that is loose and that's intriguing, but, um, but then what is the grounded thing? You know, what is the, the, um, what's the thing that, uh, that's going to make us care. And th those are the two, I think most important things, especially with horror is counterbalance that fantastic aspect of your story with something that's very grounded, you know? Um, and I grew up reading a lot of Stephen King and obviously sort of, that's probably my biggest influence. Um, and he did that very well, uh, where he would have something as, you know, crazy as a haunted car in Christine. But the thing that was grounding it was this character of this, this high school kid who's kind of a nerd and is completely ostracized and is treated poorly and really only has like one good friend and you care about him and that, and you can relate to that, you know? And so, the actual story is very grounded. Pet Cemetery is another one that is very, you know, it's this really, it's, it's just a retelling of the monkey's paw. It's, you know, there's a, there's a, a burial ground that you can bury something dead in that comes back to life. It's a pretty fantastic, you know, idea, but he grounds it with this, you know, family who's moved to this new house and is just trying to create a life here. And they're really good people. And then, the sun gets hit by a truck, you know, it's awful. It's horrible. It's the most terrifying thing you can think of. So I think really grounding that and counterbalancing that with whatever sort of the fantastic idea you have is. Is anything, anything taboo anymore? Is it possible anymore to go too far? Is anything shocking anymore? Uh, I don't know that anything's shocking anymore. It might be to some people, but I think someone somewhere is into something messed up or doing something messed up that if you can imagine it, it's happening probably in the real world. It's, 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 a, it's I think the internet has let us know that, that, that it's a, you know, the world is, is more terrifying than we ever imagined. But um Taboo, I, I think, here's the thing. I, I feel like horror is an interesting genre because I, I feel like I feel it's the one genre that is supposed to make you uneasy. It's supposed to get under your skin and shock you and, and, and uh, bother you and leave you like feeling like you kind of went someplace that maybe you wouldn't, you didn't want to go or you didn't, you normally wouldn't go. And, and feeling like you want to hop into bed with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I've read plenty of books. I mean, there are, there are a lot of books that do it in a very sort of, you know, uh, graceful way. And there are, there are books that I've read that do it in a very shocking, disturbing way. And I, and I've read them and there are things in them that just are horrible. And, and I don't necessarily, you know, maybe there's even things that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a scene, probably the mo one of the most disturbing things it, it, uh, in really, well, definitely any Stephen King book I've read. Um, was in it and it's a very tiny moment in it that most people probably don't even remember but there's this there's a bully in it <clears throat> and he's a psychopath he's a, a, an absolute horrible person and there's a, a moment where it, he spends a couple pages talking about the backstory of this kid and how when he, when the bully his parents had a, a new baby he would sneak in and he would 
he would stand over the baby's crib and he would cover the baby's mouth until and just like cover it a little bit and then take his hand away and it would gasp for breath and 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 kind of be okay and he kept doing it for longer and longer because he hated this new baby that was in the house and that to me was horrifying i didn't want to read that i don't want to read about anyone doing that but it really stuck with me and to me that's what it got under my skin it's in my bones it's it makes me oh it just makes me you know makes me really grossed out and freaked out but that's i think what good horror does I do think that there's a responsibility in writing things like that, where you, if you're just doing it for shock value, or you're just doing it to kind of prove how demented you can be and depraved, then, um, then I, I don't think that's effective. And I don't think it's necessary. I think it's then, then it just gets ugly. I will say there's a difference between horror that is effective and scary and makes you uneasy and, and maybe is, you know, crosses a line, but if, but then there's, there's a way of doing it that is, is artful, even if it's graphic and there's, and there's a way of doing it where it's just ugly. It's, you can just tell it's written by someone who just is an ugly person and just wants to, wants to, you know, it's hateful. And I think that, um, I don't think there's really any there's it's not necessary there's no place for that i think that uh especially in dealing with characters who maybe come from a different walk of life than you who um you know are who you if you're writing about an experience that you have an experience that you know a character who's gone through things that uh that you never went through or or will go through there's a responsibility there to, to do it right, you know, and to really do your best. And I think that, um, like, I, I like writing female characters. And, but as a guy, there is a, absolutely a learning curve. I will never write a hundred percent authentic female character because I've never experienced that. And, and even though I can really try to try my best to put myself in, that person's shoes, um, I'm going to make mistakes. And I think that the best thing is to learn from those. And I think, you know, uh, when I wrote Violet, which is very, almost every character in, in Violet is a woman. There are a few men, but they're very, very much just sort of secondary characters or, or you know, peripheral characters. And, um, and I really, you know, I tried to approach that respectfully and I tried to try to write that in a way that wasn't a guy writing a female character. You well, I'm going to have to read that one next. I love what you did with TC Moore. So. And more, more is more is divisive because more yeah. is a different, you know, she, she's sort of trying to throw what the way that guys act, she's basically sort of, trying to act that way times 10 to go, Hey, I'm going to beat you at your own game. Yeah. And so, so that was, she's, she's different with, with, uh, with Violet. Um, it's really about this mother. Um, it, it, it's, uh, very quickly. It's about this woman named Chris who is, um, has, when she was a kid, she, uh, when she was like 10 years old, her mother was dying of cancer. And so she went to, um, uh, this lake house with uh, that her family owned in Kansas. And um, her dad took Chris and her mother there so they could spend one last summer uh, together before, because they knew the mother was dying of cancer and she didn't have much longer. And for Chris, she remembers that very fondly. She, that it was a very sort of beautiful bonding summer uh, and, uh, for her. Um, now she's grown up, she's 40. She has a daughter, an eight-year-old daughter of her own, and Chris's husband has just died in a car accident. And so she now lives in Colorado, and she decides to uh, take her daughter to this lake house where um, she, uh, uh, you know, sort of healed herself. Um, a lake house, and a lake house will always bring to mind horror. Yes, bad things happen at lake houses. Um <laughs> anything on a lake, a camp, anything, bad things happen. So, um, 
so she takes her daughter Sadie to this 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 uh, house that she hasn't been back to since she was a kid. Um, that that um, and you know it's run down. It's not the way she remembered it. Um, but while they're there, the longer they're there, her daughter Sadie starts to play with an imaginary friend named Violet. And then we realize that Chris, when she was there, she also had an imaginary friend named Violet. Oh. And Ooh. now Sadie is possibly playing with the same imaginary friend that Chris had, uh, this friend who has been left at this house for 30 years, abandoned and alone. Um, and uh, that, that was very much a mother and daughter story. And so I really, you know, I learned things from Kill Creek and I applied them to, and again, that comes from constructive criticism, hearing feedback, hearing people, you know, people reading your stuff and giving you uh, great notes that then you can apply to the next thing. All right. Well, speaking of the next thing, what is next other than the workshop you're going to present to the Chaffee County Writers Exchange on October 16th? What's next for you in writing or TV or what are you working on? Um, I'm well, uh, I'm working on several things. I, I, for the past about uh, 15 years uh, have been, um, I kind of got into kids TV, kids and family by accident. But not horror, not horror, not kids horror. Not, I've done a little bit of kids horror, but, but that's, I've only been able to do that a couple times. Uh, I've, I kind of accidentally got into kids and family, um, television and it, it's been very kind to me. And, uh, and that's really how I make my living. Um, so I've, I've done, uh, I've run, created and run uh, with, with a writing partner, um, three, let's see, uh, three shows for Disney Channel um, and one for Netflix uh, and done some stuff for Nickelodeon. Uh, and now uh, I did the first season of Raven's Home on Disney Channel which was the sort of reboot of That's So Raven, which was one of their most popular um, shows ever. And uh, that's now in its fifth season. I did the first season, we left and went some, did some other things. And now uh, we're back for the fifth season. We're going to be doing um, uh, the, the fifth season of Raven's Home. Um, and then uh, I have a couple other projects that I'm trying to get going um, at Disney Channel. And, uh, and then, um, I'm, uh, I wrote a, a feature version of Violet that I'm trying to get, uh, get going as a film. I, I, I adapted Kill Creek um, that is with a director now and, and we're hopefully gonna get that going uh, in the next uh, you know, few months or next year. Uh, there's another horror script that I wrote that's an original that I wrote with a, another writer that uh, a, direct, a director's attached to that. And so we're hoping to get that going. Uh, and then I have, um, an, uh, I'm kind of working on short stories. I wrote a novella last uh, fall. Um, uh, I was in Vancouver for five, about five months uh, doing a, 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 this was actually a horror series that is coming out in October. It's called Day of the Dead for sci-fi. <clears throat> um, and that's a, not a kid's thing. That's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a TVMA grown, thing, grown up thing. Uh, that will be premiering October 5th on Sci-Fi Channel. Uh, and that's a, it's a series based on George Romero's movie, Day of the Dead from the eighties. And, um, but while I was up there, I was stuck in isolation. I was really, I was working on this movie. I couldn't come back and see my family. They couldn't come up and see me because of the pandemic. And so I wrote a, a novella called The Boy in the Woods that is uh, available on inkchairs.com um, as a digital book. Um, and uh, it's, uh, so I wrote that and that was really fun because it's, you know, 90 or 100 pages and I could really just kind of dive into the story and, and speed through it and have some fun. So I'm working on another one of those. I'm working on another novella right now and some other short stories and I'm hoping uh, maybe we'll lead to a collection. Nice. All right. Well, now for my penultimate question, because I had to use the word penultimate today um, and, I, and I'm not going to tell. All right. I'm not going to tell anybody. But, and I'm sure you've been asked this question a million times, but it's because it's a good one. Kill, marry, sleep with Stephen King, H.P. Lovecraft, Edgar Allan Poe. 
<laughs> I guess I would kill H.P. Lovecraft because he was a racist, uh, even though I like his stories. <laughs> um, but he was a profound racist and I would kill him. Um, <clears throat> I, you would you would never marry uh, Edgar Allan Poe, so I would marry Stephen King, and I would sleep with Edgar Allan Poe. That seems like the right mix. It seems like the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, how can people find you in your work? <laughs> um, uh, I'm still. That's thinking, my last question. <laughs> I'm still thinking about Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> now it's stuck in my head. Um, <laughs> I am uh, so you can find my you can find Kill Creek and, and Violet my two books on Amazon and Barnes and Noble uh, in Barnes and Noble on their websites like any any really any you know most bookstores should have them uh, any you know online bookseller uh, will have those you can also find them at inkshares.com which is my publisher um, the boy in the woods which is the novella I told you about is available exclusively on inkshares.com um, and then uh, as a digital download. And then um, uh, you can find, uh, I actually, you can follow me on Twitter um, at, uh, it's at Ninja Whenever, which is to the combination of my first two Disney shows, uh, which were uh, Randy Cunningham, Ninth Grade Ninja and Best Friends Whenever. Um, so my Twitter handle is, is Ninja Whenever. Um, and, uh, um, I also have a Facebook page, um, that is my author page that you can find, uh, if you want to follow me there and, uh, yeah, that's really the best way to, to find me. Scott Thomas, thank you for visiting with Alligator Preserves today. I look forward to perhaps someday when you come back to BV, uh, I'll come up and I'll say hello, or you can come down and meet my ducks. Yeah. Uh, until then keep writing wonderful things and, and keep getting scared because, you know, I think it's, it's important for us to feel things. That's the bottom Absolutely. line, right? Why we write yeah. to feel whatever it is we want to feel. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Stay well, stay healthy, and uh, we'll be in touch. And listeners out there, we've been talking with and visiting with Scott Thomas. I will have links to things we discussed and some photos, some awesome photos that Scott sent me on my webpage at leadvillelaurel.com. So check it out and uh, keep reading, everybody. Bye. <laughs>